All right. Hello, and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Alan Watke, an event coordinator with Politics and Prose. Uh, thank you all for joining us today in what is recognized as William Shakespeare's birthday. And who better to have than Emma Smith, who's been called a star in a generation of Shakespeare scholars. Um, and in a new format uh, where we continue to bring you um, the authors you love and their new books to the politics and prose community. Um, at any time during the event, you can click on the green button below uh, to purchase uh, Emma Smith's book. And um, that will take you directly to the politics and prose website. Our physical store is actually closed and we do need your online purchases in order to keep bringing you this, this type of programming that politics and prose is known for. Um, tonight, you can ask uh, Emma uh, an, a question by clicking on ask a question below, um, which can be found just below at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can also upvote those to hear the questions you wanna hear the most. Um, and then a reminder, like unlike our in-person events, the author, host, and audience members cannot see you through the screen. So feel empowered to stay in your PJs without judgment. Uh, finally, we wanna thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers, keeping our business and our spirits afloat. And so without further ado, tonight I am so excited to welcome Emma Smith to PMP Live, celebrating her newest book, This is Shakespeare. Emma Smith is a professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the Hepford College. She has uh, published and lectured widely on Shakespeare. Um, and this is like almost her 15th book on Shakespeare. So we're very excited to have to bring you with us. Um, joining Emma in conversation tonight will be Jim Shapiro. Shapiro is professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University, who specializes in Shakespeare and, early and the early modern period. And so now it's my pleasure to welcome Emma Smith and Jim Shapiro to PMP Live. Hey, Emma. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. It's good to see you. I know you were supposed to come to New York and we were gonna do an event there before you went on to politics and prose, but I'm very glad to uh, be with you here virtually at the least. It's a fantastic opportunity. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> well, I get to ask you before we open it up to Q&A in about 25 minutes or so, I get to ask you all the questions that I wanted to ask you when I read this book, I guess when it was in proofs and sent out and uh, I joined Hilary Mantel and Mark Drabble and others giving it the advanced praise that uh, it merited and, and deserved. So if you don't mind, I'll, let me just ask you a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you. First, the title, This is Shakespeare, which you talk a little bit about in your introduction. So I thought you might share with us here how you came to that title, the titles you rejected along the way, and how you feel about that title now? Oh, it's a great question. And in fact, I was searching uh, um, on my hard drive um, and for, for part of the book uh, in its early stages, and I saw some of those um, previous titles. When I submitted it to Penguin, it was called How to Read Shakespeare. Um, in some ways, that's got the same uh, hubris that those titles have got a, a kind of um, uh, a, a sense of themselves, haven't they? Um, the, my original title, um, I suppose, had a little bit more sense of process, uh, and the title I've ended up with seems a bit more of a statement. What I try and do in the beginning of the book is, well, modify or at least explain what I mean by uh, by this is Shakespeare, and to suggest that the Shakespeare um, is almost uh, a verb rather than a noun. It's a more unsettled, a more uh, incomplete, a more provisional, and therefore, to me, a more exciting uh, proposition. I like the title, uh, um, but I think it gives us, it could give a more monolithic sense uh, than I want to, because the, that, that's kind of the opposite of what I'm saying about Shakespeare, that there are um, there are Shakespeare's uh, and, and very, very many of them. 
This is a book I'm, I wish I could have written. Uh, I don't think I could have written it. The degree of difficulty in writing this kind of book is extremely high. And it may look to a common reader like the sort of thing that any Shakespeare professor could write. It, it is the sort of book every Shakespeare professor would want to write. But it's given to very, very few. I think of Mark Gobber. I think of you, really, as the only two uh, Shakespeare scholars who have managed to write this kind of book. And to get at what I mean, um, I, I'd love for you to take us through really the extraordinary process that moved the book from, I suppose, your reading and reflection into the classroom onto the podcast, and then into book form. A process really not unlike Shakespeare's own reading, the staging of his plays in front of an audience, and then ultimately uh, the print version. So if you might share with us a little bit about that process, because the gestation period was mm -hmm. quite long on this, yeah. much longer than the average book, and probably two or three times longer than the average book written nowadays by uh, a British academic. So fill us in a little yeah. bit about that. No, that's, that's absolutely right. And one of the things I, um, I'm most proud of about this book is it really reflects uh, years and years of conversation, conversation with students, with theatre goers, with uh, all the people who have an interest or a, a thing to say about Shakespeare, sometimes um, uh, a kind of be in their bonnet, sometimes a kind of, you know, go on, convince me kind of uh, attitude. So I feel as if I've talked a lot about this material and I've uh, it, it's changed in those conversations. Um, I gave uh, a, a series of uh, lectures uh, in the English faculty in Oxford, early on actually in uh, Apple's development of what was then iTunes U and what were going to be podcasts, kind of before podcasts were a thing. And the university was part of a pilot, the Oxford University was part of a pilot to, to, to join with them. And they said it would be helpful for your students if you put these lectures up, uh, because then they'll be able to access them at times when they don't go to the lecture theatre. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, I never really thought that anybody else would listen to them or find them. Um, and I think if I had realised that, I probably would never have put the lectures up. Um, uh, because uh, even though I do hope everybody's pressing the green button and buying my book, there will never be as many people buy my book as have listened listened to the lectures. That's that's been uh, that will have been the most um, influential or impactful thing. If I do anything impactful in, in my career, it will have been those those lectures online. Um, and could you could you share with American? Uh, listeners right now the enormous response those lectures got in in the uk yeah so particularly um particularly in the uk in the sort of um from high schoolers through to um you know retirees going back to shakespeare uh to you know university students all kinds of people i got an enormous and kind of constant response. Uh, people who are going to see a particular play who wanted to listen to the lecture beforehand. Um, uh, these, they, they really did take off in, in, in ways which were very, very kind of gratifying, nerve wracking, kind of wonderful. Um, and uh, so those lectures are still still around. They're, still, they're on um, the Apple uh, podcast site or on the podcasts at Oxford University site. Um, and then I got the opportunity from um, Penguin, who published the book in the UK, to uh, to develop those into uh, in, into a book. And I decided that I would pick uh, twenty of the plays rather than the thirty or so on which I had lectured. I haven't uh, I haven't lectured on everything. Um, not least because I need an audience of my own students to come to the lectures, and the ones I've got left to do would be sort of three Henry the Sixth, um, those kinds of things, and that's going to be a bit of a tall order. I've I've I've, uh, I've used all the uh, three Henry Six. I think is a great play, but I would uh, have to get the students in the room first to. Uh, uh, before I could persuade them. Maybe one good thing I should say about our Oxford system is uh, our lectures are optional. So there's a lot of emphasis on uh, lecturers, um, uh, you know, developing uh, 
uh, lectures that the students really opt, opt to come to, will opt to come to. Uh, so I had the great job then of, of moving uh, my uh, lecture style uh, into, into slightly more formal prose, although the book is not uh, is not very formally written. It made me realise what an enormous amount of repetition there is in my lectures, um, and uh, how really once I pruned them down, there was a, that they, you know, they were very very much shorter. Um, uh, and to rethink some of the things that people had asked me uh, uh, about them. Um, so, so they are substantially substantially different. Could you talk about the challenges of translating really a lecture into a podcast, but then into a book for people who are fundamentally readers rather than taking it in uh, through a podcast? Yeah, I think that's 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 a really good, uh, it's a really good question. It's thinking about the pace, isn't it, of, of, of the information, what kind of, uh, what kind of material people can be uh, expected to look at. I had to think again about how much to assume that people knew. I don't tend to give plot summaries, although my book goes through uh, 20 different plays. I think I, it, it's not because I necessarily feel everybody knows these plots already. I sort of think you don't really need to for the chapters, but that that can be found somewhere else if, if, if you feel you want that. Um, so that was one of the one of the decisions, partly because I didn't want the book to be too um too schooly i think there's that, you know that, that's one of the difficulties that all of us who are uh, thinking about how um people might elect to to think about shakespeare to come to the theater to to read shakespeare to read books about shakespeare who aren't going to do a test or an exam or something on it um what's the what's the correct tone uh what's the most inviting and inspiring tone that you can adopt uh, for those for those kinds of really well well informed readers that we all we all want well you're a great stylist and the last thing anybody i think would think while reading the book was that it's a prep book for going to see a play it's a mm. very um it's a provocative book in a certain way because its intention is to provoke readers to think beyond the received wisdom they may have received in school along the way. And one of the, to me, one of the great, great insights uh, and engines of the book is your notion of gappiness. And I, I'm, I'm hoping you might talk about that a little bit. So I, um, I, I thought about a Shakespeare whose works feel to me uh, incomplete. Uh, they've got space in them, they've got holes in them, uh, they've got uh, kind of Air, air, air spaces for us to breathe. But I wanted to express that in a way which is positive. These are not things that are missing, but these are spaces in, in which we can uh, express ourselves or identify ourselves through our reading of, of Shakespeare. Uh, and so gappiness for me um, was uh, the, the, the main characteristic of Shakespeare's works and, it, and it's what, what accounts for their uh, reinterpretability in all kinds of different contexts and in different ages and in different languages um, because there are so many things that are unexplained, that are ambiguous, that are unresolved, uh, that can be recast by uh, readers and, and directors. Uh, that felt to me uh, the thing I wanted to get across about Shakespeare and it was the very opposite of um, the idea that I think lots of people do um, worry about that there is a there is an answer to Shakespeare. There is a message that Shakespeare is trying to get across, and if they haven't picked that up, it's that it's their fault for not being good readers. I wanted to say I don't think Shakespeare's sending us messages, or even if he were, I don't think that would be important in our reading in 2020. Why do you think there hasn't been a kind of critical tradition from Dr. Johnson and Coleridge on down to the present? that is attentive to this gappiness because the argument you make seems obvious, transparent, and, and an important way into the play. So is there a reason why people have shied away from, uh, from gappiness? Um, I think that the urge to uh, fix these plays, to fix these great works, and to, and to recruit them for 
aesthetic or political or ideological purposes as I mean as your recent book showed so so brilliantly I mean that's been such a strong urge hasn't it through for, for all kinds of critics and in some ways I mean I, I I don't I don't at all suggest that I'm immune to that I mean gappiness is precisely uh if you wanted to critique what I'm saying you would say this is the uh, version of Shakespeare for a kind of atomized me generation where it's what I say and what I want to get from the plays that most matters uh, and that you know that, that a sense of a uh, collective or, or hierarchical um, order of, of of interpretations that's gone that's very much of now I can I can absolutely see that and some of the questions that I'm interested in the plays the ways they might speak to modern uh, modern concerns about identity say um that you know that that's all of that, that's of our, our period so th this isn't um, a kind of transcendent view of shakespeare it's a, it's a it's a present one um but i hope it's um a permissive one i hope it, it's an enabling one uh, for people besides besides me i'm at the point in uh my semester as i do distance teaching through zoom with my columbia students where we're reaching the late plays. And I've been returning to chapters on The Tempest and The Winter's Tale, which are really beautiful, elegant, and uh, rich chapters. And it struck me that those two plays in particular uh, exemplify your notion of, again, gappiness, of those spaces, of those unanswered and perhaps unanswerable questions. and. Um, I'd love to hear your reflections on either or or both of them. Yes, this great gap of time. Um, uh, the, even the word the word gap uh, is coming coming in there. Yeah, that they're amazing plays. I was thinking about uh, Winter's Tale, um, uh, one of the many uh, small. Uh, but nevertheless, sort of significant sadnesses I think we're all labouring with now, things that were, were going to be done or we were going to enjoy, which are not going to uh, now happen, was um, a, a production of The Winter's Tale in, in Stratford-upon-Avon that the Royal Shakespeare Company, Erica Wyman, was uh, was was just on the brink of, of opening uh, as we went into lockdown here in the UK. And we were talking about, we were just talking today about how The Winter's Tale, it, it, it seems such an extraordinary play for for now. It's a play which is um, about what happens uh, after tragedy, or or what happens if you don't sort of drop the curtain um, uh, or, or or take your own life at the point when you realise uh, how how wrong you've been, which is a, a classic tragic uh, pattern. But that you have to push to push through that. You have to get on. You have to uh, live with what's happened to live with yourself you have to find some kind of not a happy ever after but some kind of reconciliation so it seems a very modern kind of a play um and, and rather a beautiful sort of hopeful play in some ways uh for, for now but i think um particularly in the case of the winter tale uh it has a, a really good example of one of the most obvious ideas of uh, instances of happiness in the plays which is sort of silence or or what's what's unsaid uh, at the end of the play husband and wife are again on the stage together it's probably a bit too much to say they're reunited although they may be um, uh, there are lots of different ways one could take uh, the fact that Hermione addresses herself entirely uh, to her daughter and not to her husband um, you know there are lots of ways to play uh, that touching um, but uh, that, that scene that's still very much marked by loss, the loss of time, the loss of uh, the time that could have been together, the loss of the family, the loss of Mamilius. Um, so, so I think endings uh, are one one place where structural um, place where Shakespeare very very often leaves things uh, really really open. Winter's Tale is a good example. My students, of course, want an answer to the question how does Hermione respond to the gap of time to her uh, jealous husband at this point, since no words pass between them. And they're also aware that in Pericles, which Shakespeare had written not too long before that, there are words exchanged and it's a very different 
reunion of husband, wife, and daughter. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. And that, that obviously Shakespeare's working on that kind of scenario, isn't he, in, in, in these in these late plays and and uh, and the idea um, the idea that something about masculinity can be restored through through the family. It's it's uh, it, it twists to what he does in the comedies, I think, where it's uh, it's women who are looking uh, looking to make partnerships or who are the active agents in partnerships. And there's something that different that happens at this at this point uh, at this point here. But it's uh, I suppose the the thing that seems wonderful to me about about Shakespeare is I think I think the point of the Winter's Tale or the point of a, of, a, of of any of the plays is actually to ask the question: Can Hermione? Uh, can Hermione be reconciled to, to, to Leontes? I don't think it can answer that question. I think it's the asking of the question that's the important, the important thing that the play does. And that's why they're such good vehicles to think with and have been good vehicles to think with for all kinds of, um, from all kinds of points of view. You know, for hundreds of years, Shakespeare expert scholars have taken the opportunity to write a book to answer those questions. And what I really, really love about your book is your refusal to answer questions which, and I truly agree with this, we don't have answers to when Shakespeare doesn't give us answers to. Yeah, and I think I think the plays, I, I feel as if the plays are saying to us, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, you know, what, what do you think about, uh, you know, were, were, the, were the assassins, were the, were the conspirators right to kill Julius Caesar? I think the play mm -hmm. says, you know, that's such a good question. I've just I've been really, really tussling with that. It's really hard to know. <laughs> yeah, so you, were I, I, brave. <laughs> you were very brave to write about the Tempest, which in the aftermath of the shift from a father knows best Prospero mm -hmm. to the evil uh, imperialist Prospero mm -hmm. makes it really uh, a dangerous play in which to express your views and again your approach i thought was was quite brilliant can you talk a little bit about the tempest as, as well yeah so the in some ways what i tried to tackle in the tempest was the received wisdom and and, and this the the sort of strength and the appeal of the idea that prospero is a shakespeare figure uh why why we have that uh why that came about what kind of work that's done uh for us and how that uh how that might change or how that might be made more difficult uh, when we take on um much more, more recent work um uh, uh jim's book book on shakespeare in divided america talks really about the discovery or, or the the invention stroke discovery of the tempest as an american play as a virginian play uh kind of round about the turn of the 20th century it's that kind of time isn't it yeah. um what what happens when we uh what when we see the play um in that kind of context uh what what does that do to our idea of uh, prosperous kind of authority and uh, and and the kind of character study that we've been used to doing and and, and there you know there are big questions about how uh, lateness, the idea of lateness affects that. There sometimes has been a kind of sentimentality about late plays that they represent a kind of summation of wisdom or a, or a high point. And that, that may be true, but there may be other ways to see that. Um, I was interested in thinking about The Tempest, about artists who, you know, definitely get worse rather than better when we all know about, you know, um, I don't know, musicians that we wish had not made a, you know, final album or, um, you know, I think about Hitchcock or someone like that who I don't think gets better. Or, you know, there, there, there are a lot of ways of seeing that seeing that differently. So I just wanted to um, uh, just put, shake a bit some of the pieties we've got about, about that play, um, because in some ways they, uh, they seem to me to summarise some of the pieties we have about Shakespeare more generally. Let me ask you two, two more questions before we, we open it up. Uh, the first question is, uh, I know, and your British audience knows, that you've also uh, 
done extraordinary podcasts on Shakespeare's contemporaries and your knowledge and uh, uh, insights into those writers is, is really fantastic. Are you planning to write a companion volume, uh, all of Elizabethan and Jacobean uh, dramatists to go with this one? Because I think we really need to reintroduce readers to, to some of those extraordinary contemporaries. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting suggestion, and maybe maybe I should. Um, what attracts me about Shakespeare, as I say, is we're kind of pushing at an open door. Everybody already knows knows this stuff and has a view, whether that's positive or negative. It's not uh, it's not complete indifference. Um, there's a different kind of obligation, isn't there? There's a different kind of ethics, in fact, about how you introduce uh, material to to people who don't know that material um uh do you then have to explain it in some neutral kind of a way i'd have to think about how that, how that would how that would work um but i did i did love those uh those not shakespeare uh, lectures very much brilliant and i think as as uh as a group those of us who who love renaissance drama uh we have failed to popularize those contemporaries and focused for complicated reasons uh, yeah. on, on that open door of, of Shakespeare. Yeah, Shakespeare, it ought to be the, gate, the gateway to that, to the period, but there's something about, and, and in some ways my book, ampli you know, is, is, is as guilty of that as any other, uh, a kind of exceptionalism about Shakespeare, which um, dehistoricizes him, so, so, so plucks him out from from that world of the other dramatists, and and sees him uh, sees his works more in in, in either in con, you know in our own contemporary times, uh, and that that hasn't been yeah that's really um, uh, impoverished I think our sense of of, of the, the theatrical culture that he writes from. My last question is um, is uh, a bit unfair, and you can deflect it if you if you like. I know that This is Shakespeare contains uh, chapters on 20 of the plays, and mm -hmm. there are a number of those that you did uh, podcast for and didn't include, and there are a couple, the Henry VI Part Three, that mm -hmm. you didn't include at all. When I stand in front of um, my students at Columbia and run through the canon in the course of a year, two semesters, mm -hmm. I know there are probably 12 or 13 plays that are my A-list plays, plays that I could come to class um, without having had a cup of coffee or even hung yeah. over. Uh, yeah. and, and I just, I can navigate through those plays. It's as if you're walking into a dark apartment, lights are out, and you can find your way into the bedroom without knocking anything over. Those are your A-list plays. The yeah. B-list plays, you might bump into a lamp or a chair. And the C-list plays are those you just uh, fall and crash when you enter into that dark apartment. And I've reread uh, This is Shakespeare. I can't tell if you have any C-list plays or even B-list plays. So does it work like this for you or are you just more skilled at masking the plays that you don't fully feel fluent in? Uh, um, there are definitely, uh, I definitely have C-list plays that I'm not comfortable with. I'm not comfortable, it's a really great image, the image of the apartment in the dark. I can't, I can't feel my way around and I would need to, to prep and to think about. There are definitely C-list plays for me uh, that I haven't, that I did, didn't write about in, in, in the book. Um, and some of those are probably plays which many people find difficult. Um, uh, I can give you some titles if you want. Love's Labour's Lost. I don't find an easy play to get into. Um, uh, Two Noble Kinsmen, the collaboration with Fletcher. I don't feel I know uh, as much as I would like to know about it. And in fact, I've just seen that it's one of the plays uh, from Shakespeare's Globe that they have put on to uh, a free streaming. And I thought this is going to be my lockdown prep. So maybe I'll get a bit more comfortable, but a bit more comfortable with that. But if I tell you the thing I really can't get get round, you, you, I think I've admitted this to you before, Jim. It's actually uh, the thing I really need to prep during lockdown is is sonnets. Mm. 
teach this on a, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not in my A-list. <laughs> I, um, I now force myself to teach the sonnets every year, and it's the only way. And I must say, I'm, I'm good at about a dozen sonnets, mm -hmm. so I have 130 some odd to yeah. go. Yeah, me, me too. The first A-list Shakespeare work for me was Antony and Cleopatra. I'm just curious what the first play you felt you really understood. I think that's a really great question. I think perhaps, I thought I did. I mean, my understanding of these plays changes, uh, you know, changes such a lot. Uh, I think the play I thought I understood was probably Twelfth Night. Mm. That's uh, definitely that's one of my B-listers. Is it? Yeah, I, I definitely. I thought it this year for the first time, I resisted it for that reason. And I thought it's time, just confront Twelfth Night. And my students get it. I mean, they just get it. That's, that's amazing, because I mean, Anthony and Cleopatra is not, um, I don't think that will be top of everybody's list. Are, are, you, are you on the side of, uh, of, of reading or watching? Um, I've never, I've never gotten a chance to see a truly great Anthony and Cleopatra. I've worked on a couple, but um, it's, it's. Um, I think the place choose us. I don't think we choose them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I see that. I definitely see that. So at this point, let's open it up, and I'd be grateful if you could take the questions and and the ones that you want to take and read them aloud or recite what they are, and then we'll we'll do our best to engage those questions. Okay, so there's a question um, here that I think you, I'd be really interested to know what, what you think as well, Jim, because it builds on what we've just been talking about. Beth has said uh, um, that she, she, get, she gets that the book doesn't require deep prior knowledge of Shakespeare's works, but what's the best of his works to read first as an entry point? Um, what would you, what, what, what would you recommend? I think it's it's a little different for an American audience. We all have read a, a mini canon that's really four or five plays in America. The ones we all read as part of the common core, the ones that have been established in America for, for decades, if not for over a century. And, and I, I guess I would go with the, those most familiar plays, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, you're, you're brilliant on all of them. And I think with just enough familiarity or recall, your book provides enough to wrestle with and then send readers back to the play. I don't know if you have a, a different take on that. Mm. I think sometimes when people when people ask me this kind of question, the, the play that comes to my mind is Macbeth. Mm. Um, and Macbeth is is very much in the core in in the in UK UK education. People would tend to have come, you know, got some familiarity with that already. And going back to that play, uh, I think I think uh, or encountering it for the first time uh, can be a really good reading experience. Um, not least because it's uh, shorter than the uh, than the average, and and it's not. Uh, it's not enmeshed with a with a subplot which you have to keep disentangling. It's quite a slim down sort of thriller sort of fit feel to it. Uh, so may, maybe Macbeth. Uh, uh, that's that great. Uh, I I agree. That is the right choice. Should we take uh, another question? Let's have another question. Um, yeah. What, uh, so, so, so Ramsey has asked about the sonnets. Where do you think they rank in terms of all his works? And who do you believe he was writing about? I'll, I'll take that first and you can correct me if yeah. uh, you think I'm wrong. <clears throat> um, I'm one of those scholars who believes that um, the energy so many for generations have put into discovering the story of the sonnet who was the dark lady, who was the young man, are completely um, pointless, dead-end questions that detract us from wrestling with these incredibly naughty and rewarding 14-line artifacts. And if we dispense with that 
distracting narrative of who they were written for. To my mind, really, they're um, rough sketches for the intense emotional plots in the plays. And if we had another hour or so, we could go through individual sonnets and the ways in which a play like Othello can be traced back to some of the later sonnets with their intense exploration of jealousy and resentment. So Shakespeare's working in small form in those poems with what he would develop in a much, on a much larger canvas in, in the plays. That's, that's my take on the sonnets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I really do completely agree with that. And one, one thing that is interesting to me about Shakespeare, the poet, um, is that, you know, in, um, in 1593, when uh, Venus and Adonis and, and then the next year, Lucrece, these, these long narrative poems come out uh, under aristocratic patronage. They're the first printed uh, works to bear Shakespeare's name. They're hugely successful. So that he's successful both in gaining patronage as part of the system of, of, of literary publishing and in terms of sales. So he's, he's, he's successful in two, two sort of two aspects of the market for poetry. What seems really striking to me is that that's not what Shakespeare, Shakespeare's wrote pretty young at that point, pretty early in his London career. He doesn't make that his priority. That, that isn't the life, that isn't the writing life he wants. Uh, and I think and, why and, Shakespeare is really a dramatist. Yeah. That's what he's really and, and I would add to that, um, one of the, the major reasons why Shakespeare is spending that time on Lucrece and mm -hmm. on Venus and Adonis is a pandemic has closed the theaters and they would be closed for over a year. He had to make a living. And in much the same way that playwrights and actors right now are struggling to find a way of uh, supporting themselves as writers, that's what Shakespeare was doing when he was writing those, those long poems. And I'm sure he was incredibly relieved when in 1594, he could go back to writing plays again. There's, an, there's a couple of questions on a similar uh, similar theme. Audrey's asking about whether dramatists of the period were writing in different styles, what were the subjects of some of the great non-Shakespeare plays of the period. And in some ways we need her in touch with Kate, who is talking about uh, a, a reading group, a book club, doing some of the contemporaries, pairing, pairing non-Shakespearean drama with, with Shakespeare, um, uh, Marlowe's Jew of Malta with The Merchant of Venice. Um, uh, Kate, Kate says that the non-Shakespearean plays are all making Shakespeare look even better uh, by comparison. Um, so that's that's a really in interesting one to think. Um, it comes back to what Jim was asking me about the non-Shakespearean drama uh, and my answer that by pulling Shakespeare out, we perhaps do a disservice to that ecosystem that he was uh, he, he was part of. Um, I mean, Shakespeare's clearly been deeply impressed by Marlowe and uh, by his work, and that's the, that that's something which I think Shakespeare carries with him right through to the Tempest at the end of his uh, at the end of his career. Uh, so Shakespeare is not um, uninfluenced by, uh, by by other uh, other writers. I think he's uh, and more and more scholars want to see him as somebody who actually collaborates. Uh, with other writers is part of a more um, uh, a sort of team approach to, to the writing or the development of scripts for the for the early modern theatre. Um, there's, so, there's, a, there's a pairing that I know you know well because you podcast about it, uh, A Tamer Tamed and Taming of the Shrew. And perhaps you can recommend those as a pairing that uh, uh, Shakespeare does not necessarily come out the better of the two playwrights. Yeah, absolutely. Two, two, two plays, um, the second by John Fletcher, uh, The Woman's Prize or The Tamer Tamed, picks up the characters from the Tamed, some of the characters from The Tamed of the Shrew, picks up the story uh, and, uh, and, and turns it on its head. Um, and Fletcher, uh, I, I mean, I think if, if you're worried by the gender politics of the Tammy of the Shrew, as, as we probably all should be, then Fletcher's take on that um, suggests, importantly, that that's not just a modern phenomenon, 
Fletcher looks at that play 10 or 15 years after it was written and thinks we can't really, you know, this is not really appropriate. Uh, women need women need a bit of comeback on this story, and, and that's what he writes. Um, Emma, it looks like we might have lost you. Could you refresh your browser real quick? How's that? Is that, how, is that, no, is that a, no, I can't. It's you're only an icon. You're we can't see you anymore. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, just uh, go ahead and try and refresh. Being an icon is not a terrible thing. Emma. No. Um. Uh, the, in the in the chat, people are saying they can they can see me. Uh, okay. There you go. Okay. You're back with us. Then. Great. Thanks ever so much. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that, everyone. Sorry. Um, can I just look at? I'll just, let me just look at the questions again. Um, Jim, what about this one? Um, do you think it's Shakespeare's happiness that counts for his success in America? I think it does. Um, uh, as Emma suggested earlier, I've, I've just come out with a book called Shakespeare in a, in a Divided America. And uh, you can say in a way, although I don't use the word gappiness, that the refusal of the plays to land on one particular side of a question or another uh, has allowed Americans to appropriate Shakespeare for their own sets of beliefs. And, one of the chapters in that book explores the very different ways that John Wilkes Booth, the man who assassinated uh, President Abraham Lincoln, read Macbeth and the very, very different way in which Lincoln read Macbeth. So that even then these plays were not stable in meaning. Um, John Wilkes Booth read Macbeth as a, uh, a hyper-masculine, aggressive, man who fought unto the death. Lincoln read Macbeth as a guilt-ridden, cerebral, reflective man. And uh, each of them in a way had a Shakespeare that led them to that fatal rendezvous in April 1865 at Ford's Theater. So yes, I do think that gappiness or that openness to interpretation has allowed Americans to to wrestle with the issues that are independent of Shakespeare, that Shakespeare has allowed us to uh, address questions like immigration or race or uh, the fluidity of gender, or all, all those issues are in Shakespeare then. And they're the questions that we're still trying to resolve or navigate through as a culture right now. Perhaps related to that, um, there's, there's questions um, Christina's asked about Merchant of Venice and, and whether we feel that is relevant to, um, uh, to, to, to modern life. Um, uh, Jim, one, one, of the, one of the books which, um, uh, which I think I most have known in Shakespeare scholarship is Jim's book, Shakespeare and the Jews, uh, which is a fan fantastic, um, uh, a really fantastic exploration of, of uh, Shakespeare and, and Judaism and the way that those questions have been taken up uh, l later on. So he should answer that first, I think. Uh, although your chapter on that is really outstanding. Uh, I love your, your work on that. Well, all I would say is uh, I've always resisted in my teaching and my writing a simplification of that play into seeing it as anti-Semitic or not anti-Semitic. I think that is a, a dead end way of looking at, at Shakespeare. And I much prefer when I talk about that play to think about it as one that explores intolerance of difference, of all kinds of difference, of the Prince of Morocco's blackness, of uh, the love that is felt between Bassanio and Antonio. Uh, you can go right through every kind of uh, difference that we are wrestling with in our own culture, and they're all in the book, including obviously religious difference. But that's that's just one of of many forms of difference that uh, 
that are explored in this in this dark comedy. How do you how do you tackle it when you have to teach this or write about it? Um, well, in, in some ways, I think actually, um, in probably inspired by your work, that that some of the themes. Um, I mean, much much of the kind of seems to be a play which has been totally uh, un unbalanced in a way by um, our interest in Shylock, who's actually in himself rather than a minor figure in in the play. And I think you're absolutely right to think how his presence interlocks with all kinds of other forms of uh, f forms of difference um, in the play, rather than being its its only or its preeminent uh, example. I think I think that is really important. One of the things I talk about in the book is um, the uh, another modern or contemporary resonance is is sort of financial or or um, uh, in, a language of investment and risk and hazard. Um, I'm really interested in uh, those caskets. Um, if, if you see much of Venice in the theatre. You realise that actually quite a lot of it is the uh, casket scenes, all of which are quite boring actually, because we really do know because of the way the play is, uh, the play world is is set up. We know that the Prince uh, uh, of Morocco and Aragon are not going to marry Portia. That's not how it's going to work out. But nevertheless, we have to go through these rather lengthy speeches while they wrongly choose. The gold and silver caskets. They also haven't been to Fairy Tale 101, where they should know that the lead, if there's ever a lead casket, you should go for it because the, you, you look then as if you're far too high minded to care about money. And that's what Bassanio does. He's the only one of them who does care about money because he doesn't have any. Uh, and yet he, he, he manages to pull off the trick that he doesn't. He picks the lead casket and therefore gets all the money, gets Portia and gets all the money. Um, and I was interested in 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 the the prominence actually of that of that narrative of of narratives of risk and hazard, and their real real world financial implications. It's really interesting to try and trace how much three thousand ducats is. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a real lot of money. So um, that that sense of um, uh, I was interested in Bassanio uh, as a kind of um, you know, kind of put rather a poor asset, but somewhat, but, but looking as if it's a, a good, looking as if he's a good bet. Uh, he goes um, uh, dressed in in all this finery that the ducats have bought to to impress uh, Portia. There's a nice moment where she talks about him as uh, dearly, uh, dearly bought, de de dearly, and, and dearly. Uh, it's both an emotional word, clearly, uh, but it's also, I think. <laughs> proper uh, uh, kind of dollars and cents kind of a word that it's it's been a very uh, expensive bargain for her let me see sorry i'm not keeping i'm so interested in the questions that were answered i'm not quite keeping up with them um what uh, do you think uh, this is a really specific question Jim. do you think shakespeare was familiar with don quixote linda has asked that is a really great question, and so much depends upon uh, the late collaboration with Fletcher called Cardenio, which is based on uh, Don Quixote. So my sense is he was familiar with Shelton's translation of this great work that probably was brought back into England uh, when under King James in 1605 or so, the Spanish and British reached an accommodation. But sadly, almost all of Cardinio is lost to us. It only survives in a much later redaction. And um, there have been efforts uh, to turn that work. Uh, is it a double falsehood? Correct me on the title. Um, but uh, the answer is um, yes, he was familiar, but unfortunately we can't talk about his full engagement with Cervantes. Does that cover it? Yeah, that does cover it. Uh, we've got a question from Sarah. Um, Sarah's asking what play I would have liked to have, uh, to have included um, that I didn't include. 
Um, and that's a really uh, interesting question. There are two plays that I'm really uh, fascinated by in different ways and that I'd have liked to have written about. Um, one is Pericles, which I think is a really, uh, su such a striking, um, so strikingly different in certain ways, in certain formal ways from, from Shakespeare's other plays, but with some thematic familiarities and echoes that Jim actually talked about uh, earlier on. Um, so Pericles would have been one. Um, I didn't write about Pericles because in my mind, I'm a bit, a little bit tangled up with a question which I think is probably not of all that much general interest, but has become interesting to me, which is uh, whether Pericles is in fact collaborative. So it's become um, entirely accepted that it's a collaborative work with um, uh, a sort of rather low life uh, playwright character called George Wilkins. And I've just been going back to the evidence for that and feeling a bit dissatisfied uh, by it and feeling that in some ways, Wilkins, the fact that Wilkins is such an unpleasant character allows some of the unpleasantness of the play to be palmed off on him, uh, either uh, actually or, or sort of um, uh, metaphorically and, and keep Shakespeare um, cl clear of it. And I feel a bit suspicious of that. Anyway, I thought that was probably a bit too niche of, a, of an argument. So Pericles would have been one. And the other play I love to teach and really have seen a couple of wonderful productions in the last five years or so is King John. So the history play that is a drift of the, the big historical sequences which have tended to be the way we have seen Shakespeare's uh, historical imagination working. King John is a very interesting sardonic uh, history play, it's wonderfully free of um, divine right of kings and all that kind of nonsense. It's a very modern kind of pragmatic sense of um, the king is who we say it is or the king is whoever is uh, in power. It doesn't seem to have uh, any kind of governing um, kind of morality or, or, or kind of larger cosmic framework. It's a very, a very sort of pragmatic uh, 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 sort of um, depiction of historical causation. Uh, it ends in a slightly anticlimactic way. Um, in all kinds of ways, it's uh, it, it's perplexing and, and rewarding. So they would have been the plays that I would have added in. I was going to say, did you get a chance to see the recent production at the Swan? Yeah. at the RSC stage. It was so fresh to me. It felt like a play that um, somehow had passed under the radar and should be front and center. Absolutely. No, abs I, I thought that absolutely. And it's been, a um, there've been a couple of, of really oh. striking productions, as I say, um, in recent years. And I, and I hope we will see more. I think we have time probably for uh, one or at most two more questions. So Choose ones you feel like answering. Okay, so Jim has asked about um, uh, Ophelia to ask a really specific question. Could we talk a little bit about Ophelia? Do you see her as a victim or in her madness in some way an active participant in what's happening at Elsinore? So let's let's yeah let's 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 think about that. That's I mean that's a really interesting question. I think uh, Shakespeare's um, so let me make a very blunt statement first. Shakespeare's tragedies are pretty terrible for women. Uh, women, I mean, I get I do get that tragedy is pretty terrible for everybody, uh, but men in tragedies tend to get a bit of uh, a bit of choice and some good speeches out of. Uh, uh, their, their downfall and the women really don't they they uh, uh, that their um, their place in in Shakespeare's tragic imagination is pretty is pretty limited I think uh, and Hamlet's a really good example of that I mean I think Hamlet's claims to universal status uh, in the 21st century are looking a bit a bit shaky because it is such a it's a play which has such such a lot of problems with women with the way it presents the two female characters but also the way the whole play world um, thinks uh, th thinks about women um i'm always struck by uh, claudius uh, when he's uh, praying about uh he, he, he's when he has his aside about uh which which tells us for the first time that he has killed his brother in order to take the throne and then he, he likens this to a harlot's cheek painted uh you know saying it, it's as uh, the fact that I killed my brother and took over the throne, it's as bad as 
prostitutes wearing makeup and you think actually your your, your, your scheme of values has gone it's gone wrong so that's all a long way around of saying um i, I think it's uh it, it takes an act of kind of restitution to make Ophelia a more active participant uh, in what's happening to her. Now, those acts of restitution are almost always possible in Shakespeare's drama because of those gaps and 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 and, and spaces, and because um, uh, characters are on stage when they're not speaking, or uh, directors can interpolate all kinds of things, or or creative artists working uh, after the after the play can 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 re reinvigorate them. Um, uh, so I think I think it's a possibility, um, but I guess in some ways it, my answer to all of these things will, would be it, it could be you know, she could be she could be a more active um, presence. Um, the uh, Michael Almereda film, uh, with, which is a Hamlet, Ethan Hawke as a modern Hamlet in in New York. I think it's Claire Danes who is the Ophelia, and there are some very lovely shots of her th uh, thought sort of thought processes, and you see a lot more of. Uh, without giving her any extra lines, he gives a lot of her point of view and a lot of sense of what's going on for her. That's a smart way, I think, of, uh, of countering some of the bias that's, that, that the text can often produce. I'd only add to that that the past few years have seen leading Shakespeare actors, women actors, embracing leading male roles, King John, King Lear, Hamlet, uh, in, in the past year alone. And it's not simply because they want access to those roles. It's, I think because on stage, the inadequacies of so many of the leading parts Shakespeare wrote for, for women uh, are becoming transparent in ways that they perhaps weren't a generation ago. Why don't you take one last question, Emma? Let's see if we've got one last one, I think we're actually on top of our question. So unless somebody wants to uh, come through right now, maybe what we can have a look at is where the poll, where the poll looks. So it looks as if Much Ado About Nothing is winning on the favorite comedy and King Lear is way out uh, on the tragedies. Um, and Henry V is the best Henry. So you heard it here. You heard it here first. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you both so much. I I do have like one final question to follow up with is um, during these uncertain times, what books are you two turning to, and or what can you recommend? I'll tell you what I've been reading. I don't know if I could recommend it. It's pretty dark stuff, but. Uh, Daniel Defoe's account of uh, the plague year of 1665 uh, is extraordinary. And one of the things that's so extraordinary about it is uh, people have been there before us. The whole question of, do you escape the city for the country? Do you bring infection with you? What is the right ethical and moral response to a pandemic? are questions that Defoe wrestled with centuries ago that we are confronting yet again. And it's a very, very powerful and, and sobering read. Emma, how about you? So I have been doing what perhaps some people are doing at, uh, in stressful times, which is to go back to things I know well and to and to experience that kind of comfort of rereading. But the thing I'm reading uh, French at the moment is uh, Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light, the last mm. part of the trilogy about Thomas uh, Cromwell, um, which is a really wonderful, absorbing world, actually, completely absorbing world. I don't want it to end, although I know it's going to. Um, and everything about the book is great, except for it's just a little bit too heavy on the wrist uh, to read comfortably in bed, which is why I'm not making as much progress on it as I might do. But I really recommend, if you don't know, Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies, and now The Mirror and the Light. Um, uh, I'm sure PMP could could send them out to you. Yes, we definitely we definitely have those and can send them out. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you both so much, Emma and Jim. That was just fantastic. Um, and I just want to say, everyone that joined us today as well, I, I know that they, they all enjoyed it. and. It's been fantastic. Um, 
as your patronage is what enables us to bring you programming like this and we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sales to support them so please do uh click on that button right there um this is shakespeare it'll take you right to politics and prose website um and then also right up top uh the you'll see the politics and prose icon you can follow follow us and see what other events we have coming up um such as um on Saturday, we have Samantha Irby and what she's with Wow. No, thank you. That's at 7 p.m. And uh, on Sunday with David Al Sibley is uh, his newest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. So um, please join us for those. Follow us by Emma Smith's book. Um, and, you know, thank you both so much. This has been fantastic. Thanks. Pleasure. Emma, right. stay safe. You too, Alex. You, Jim. Thanks right. so much. Great to be beaming across the Atlantic, you guys. Thanks. Absolutely. You, Thank you.